We can't do them in isolation. We have to get a handle on our business management and our soil health. They're not one or the other because there's a temptation to go all in and throw everything at it. But without a good strategy, you're in danger of going backwards financially and we want to keep you there so you can farm really well. That was Kim Deans and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome back to another episode of The Regenerative Journey. Uh, This week it's with the wonderful Kim Deans, uh, but before I bang on about her and introduce her, um, a couple of little things I want to drop on your table, your desk, your ears. One thing that's been very interesting to watch in the last uh, couple of years, um, primarily through the the, uh, human experimentation or, or the experimentation on humans, uh, and now it seems on animals of mRNA vaccines. Um, I'm going to go there because I think it's, um, oh, I wouldn't say necessary, but certainly useful to throw uh, throw it on the table for debate. Um, some of my uh, buddies on on uh, social media have been sending me very, and I'm, I'm very grateful I have articles on more recently the um, MLA, Meat and Livestock Australia's, um, so, well, they would say initiative. I wouldn't. I'd hardly call that to um, uh, put some money. Announced funding for a project to test mRNA vaccines that can be rapidly mass produced in Australia in the, at, in the event of a lumpy skin disease or other exotic disease outbreak. This comes from an article in the uh, the Spectator. Um, I'm not sure when. Not not that long ago. Well, probably probably when you're listening, it's probably middle of June, early June. Um, just quickly, this is interesting because, you know, it was clearly, and for those who are listening to me for a while, you probably understand or um, know where I sit on the debate of the whole COVID fiasco. Um, and it, whilst it has gone away, the, the ripples, the, the repercussions of it and, and, and now, um, I won't say commonly known, Side effects or issues with mRNA vaccines that should be commonly no, um, commonly known, um, but unfortunately, mainstream media hasn't really. Are they, they're sort of dabbling in it a bit. They're just sort of going there and kind of got a bit, got a bit of an each way bet going on at the moment. Considering they are well and truly on the government and the health officials and the pharmaceuticals side, uh, a couple of years ago, they seem to be sort of sitting on the fence a bit more now. Nonetheless, um, the good news is that. People's consciousness generally um, may have been tweaked and uh, and uh, may be asking better questions about mRNA or the usefulness or uselessness of those vaccines. So now, MLA in their in their uh, in I don't know in a brain brain explosion, deciding that they might put or they are. I think they're actually putting some a fair bit of funding aside. I, I couldn't tell you how much. Um, if I read further down this article, it might tell me. But certainly they think it's a good idea. Um, they're gonna, the, the pro, this project will develop an mRNA vaccine pipeline initially for lumpy skin disease, LSD, but potentially for other emergency disease. This will enable capacity for rapid mass production of a vaccine for LSD in the event of an outbreak. No LSD vaccines are registered for use in Australia yet. While some vaccines exist out overseas, the path to registration in Australia for traditionally produced ones is longer. I wonder, if, I wonder whether me saying that word is going to get me banned, I, um, or, or or you know, less less the algorithm might pick that up and go. No, we don't want to have that on the, on the out in the world. Um, 
Uh, yes, it's longer than that of the mRNA jabs. I should just call it jab, shouldn't I? Um, so this is really interesting. I think it's a complete load of crock because um, clearly failed. It actually says here um, that uh, – where does it say here? After the spectacular failure of mRNA vaccines and human trials, the agricultural industry is pushing ahead with mRNA vaccines for livestock engaged in the food industry. We know, and it's pretty clear, the issues that those type of jabs were having with people in heart, um, respira- resp- respiratory, and other many other myriad of other um, side effects. Um, now, the, the alarm bells go off for me. You know, we're going to have similar problems with, with any animals that are jabbed with this sort of thing, regardless of the kind of um, the the disease that it's trying to it's trying to prevent or mitigate against. I don't know. It's very interesting. I get lots of people asking, um, do you or do the farmers have to jab with mRNA vaccines now? And you know, some people are saying, oh, they all you know everything that goes through a stockyard has to. That's all bollocks. Um, I don't know. There's anyone in Australia who's actually using it commercially. Uh, there might be some trials going on. Um, I know in the States there's certainly trials going on or more than trials have been developing it for more than 10 years over there. So it may well be in the pipeline in Australia for much longer than we actually understand or know about. Uh, and maybe it's just the MLAs put their hand up and made it a bit more public. But I think, um, you know, what did we learn from the last few years? Well, a lot about trust, um, not, not trusting the government, not trusting industry necessarily with things like this, which they call initiatives. And I just, I, I think it's far from an initiative. It, um, it could be a disaster. And, look, what does it do to the animals when they're jabbed with this stuff? Who knows? What does it do for people who then eat it? That's the bit that, that kind of concerns me um, more so, really. I mean, we've got to care about the health, the, the health of the animals, absolutely. Um, so the side effects of that of the animals interest me, but also if you are going, if a consumer then goes to eat that, you know, bit of beef, a lamb, whatever it is, um, yeah, are they going to actually test that? Is that part of their testing? Um, I'd be interested to know, MLA, if that's part of what you are actually going to do. You uh, have the opportunity right now to go to charliearnett.com.au and book yourself a ticket or two to our webinar series called Your Regenerative Journey. Uh, we have some amazing um, speakers. There'll be in, there's no doubt an ad in this um, in this um, episode somewhere, which I won't bang about bang on about all of the all the speakers. But I've got a fantastic lineup over eight weeks. Um, culminating with a farm trip here, excuse me, here at Hanamino on the 13th of of October. Um, A number of the guest speakers are going to be here um, chatting away. You can meet and greet them, ask them all your questions, and they're going to do little mini presentations throughout the day. So get yourself tickets. They're on our our website, charliearnett.com.au. You get to all sorts of recordings. Um, If you don't get to actual webinars themselves, you get recordings, you get um, additional information resources along with those um, webinars. And if you want to come to the farm farm day, get yourself a ticket for that as well. Now, Kim Deans, what a star. Uh, met Kim Deans. I've known, known of her for many years now, actually, given her association with the biodynamics and regenerative agriculture generally. She um, uh, she and her, um, her husband, um, Angus, live up at uh, Tingar near Inverell in sort of northern New South Wales. Uh, I met them both there. Well, I've met them before, but um, uh, I caught up with Kim at their home, the way the the oasis, and it's just a beautiful, lovely um, farm that they're um, doing some amazing work on. Um, they we talked about bushfires that went through there some years ago, not that many years ago, um, which was pretty devastating, and the recovery since then. Biodynamics. Um, Kim had just been to uh, one of our workshops by Anne Angus actually um, a couple of days before. Um, before we, I, I interviewed her. Uh, no, actually, it was the day before the the, the um, workshop started. That's I'm going crazy. Um, we talked about biodiversity. We talked about farm finances. Um, Kim has a very, very broad and interesting array of skills and experiences, and and you'll uh, will unpack some of those or most of those in this lovely, wonderful interview with Kim Deans on the regenerative journey. And now we're on Kim Deans. Welcome to. The regenerative journey. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the Oasis. The Oasis. Is this, yeah. where, is this where we are? Is yeah. it's called the Oasis? It's called the Oasis. Well, welcome to the. <laughs> where are we? The, is this the front porch? Yeah. The front veranda of the, front, the Oasis? Yeah, it is. We can see. We can see a man. 
go Tangus. Down, with electric fence posts. Down, <laughs> down in the, heading towards the sheep. Are we understanding? Is he moving sheep? No, he's going over, over the creek to, to move some cattle, actually. But that's the pretty standard view you see of Angus wandering around here with electric fence posts. It's very Just common. walking? Yep, walking. How big is the oasis? It's only 20 acres. So he I can be, say only. So he can pretty much, 20. he could walk anywhere, everywhere. We do, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And then we also run some cattle next door, so which is where he's headed now. Yeah. Oh, right. So just sort of on, yeah. on a leasing or adjustment yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. We do. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me, Kim, um, I, I love it to be here too, by the mm. way. I just I drove from Byron Bay to Danthonia to mm. where I'm staying tonight. We're doing a workshop that you, you mm. and Angus are attending, which is very exciting. It is. Um, over the next two days. So we, I dropped in there to see, to see um, your hunters and suss it, suss it all out mm. and then had a short trip down here to. Tinga, um, to is it called Tinga? Oh, when you said about tin mining, is it mm. is that is that the the, the the source of the like tin as in tin the metal, or is it mm. or is there an indigenous name Tinga and it just I'm happens to be the really same? Really not sure. I have a sense it could be one or both or either. Yeah. I know, like this whole area was mined for tin in the early 1900s, and it was actually upturned. It was there were like thousands of people living between here and what's now Cochin Dam on a 20k stretch. There were towns, villages, pubs. Yep. And then so Copton's which way from here? It's west, west. Past, due west of here. Yeah, uh-huh. it's about 20k's due west. And this was just all mine. So, yeah. So you reckon there was a lot less trees here? Do you reckon they might have got rid of a lot of trees we to then do mining? We can see areas where we believe big old trees have been cut down and to run the boilers on the dredges. So uh-huh. it would have been, it would have looked really different. And yeah. I, I would love to go back in time and see what it looked like before it was all upended. We saw a photo of our place at the local um, museum with a dredge in the creek and it was like a, it was horrific. And we really got a sense of what we what we were working the with. The disturbance. Because it was all just mined and sluiced for tin and turned over for tin all along this country. So that's mm. so that was a that's a process there's obviously water needed. Yeah. And they they mine uh, it, is it is it rock or soil or what is it or sandy or what it's, sort of like Well it's a granite. Granite. It's yeah. It's very sandy now. Yeah. Um, when we came here, been here 18 years, we had an actual sand heap that was just left from the mining of the in the creek and I was going to have a beach volleyball court there because it was perfect. But with the way we've been grazing, we now have no sand hill any longer. We still call it the sand hill, but it's all it's, grassed up. It's now up. grassed up. Yeah, and it's actually growing grass and vegetation, but it was a denuded sand heap until we changed the grazing management. Yeah, Because Tinga, I used to drive through, as I was saying to you guys yeah. before, I used to drive through Tinga um, yeah. oh, many years ago in the early 90s mm. to drive to a girlfriend's Farm out near um, between Yetman and North Star, yeah. And um, Tinga was not a highlight, no, of that trip. <laughs> no. And I was gravel, and I was in a Kingswood, and yeah. uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty tough trip. Mm. And Tinga never excited me much. Never it was, excited no. me either, Charlie. Even when we were looking at places, I, I really wasn't looking here. And the agent, we'd been looking for about six months for what we wanted, and. Um, kind of get, decided to give up <laughs> really? and just we were living in town with two kids, town two being dogs in Inverell. Inver- yeah, Inverell, yeah. yeah. We'd, we'd gotten together and we'd landed two households of stuff yeah. in one little tiny house in town and it was a bit chaos But and we were busting to get out of town because we're both country born and bred. Yeah. But we ended up having to surrender and just go with it for a bit yeah. and then the agent rang me and started. He said Tinga and I cringed. Because you, you knew about Tinga. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't kind of on my wish list, yeah. but when he described this property, it ticked every box on our list. Really? And I went, well, we better Which were, what, what were the ticks? Um, suitable for permaculture and yep. growing food. Yep. Um, space for the kids to run around and yep. to do things. Um, but it was mostly food growing, potential for livestock, potential, an interesting house, which it's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so it had, and water, like it just had everything yeah. on the list. So it was quite interesting. I disregarded the location and went, yeah, we better come and look. And here we are. <laughs> so, and you went, this is this feels all right. Yeah, it just was an instant. Yep, yeah, this is the place. Isn't that yeah. great it when that really when that cool. happens? Yeah, and we had to kind of, you know, with most things, you can't force it. Yep, you just have to let it happen when it happens. So, yeah, and by that stage, it just seemed to fall into place. And how like how many years ago was that? That was we've been here eighteen years. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, so that's been. 
been an interesting journey of learning about soil because <laughs> we, when we came here, we had a soil that had been sluiced for tin a hundred years ago and then been overgrazed, and we couldn't even grow a spinach leaf in winter. And it, we got a root shock. <laughs> it probably couldn't have been any like it, mm. you were saying before that the soil tests were like yeah. So they were so imbalanced because there was nothing there. Yeah, yeah. It was just there's not much <laughs> not much there. And so there began a journey of really learning to grow soil. And Angus is a Kiwi with a Scottish ancestry and they're pretty tight. <laughs> so they don't want to <laughs> spend a lot of money. And he's always been a grazing manager since yep. he was a child. So yeah, right. he just set about electric fences and, you know, doing what we could. Yep. Um, and we were going to just do it with grazing management. No inputs was our challenge. Yes. And then we discovered biodynamics in 2006. We did a workshop with Hamish. We're going to get to that, yeah. Yeah, and we started that. We added biodynamics to the grazing management and that has been our soil restoration pretty much journey. That's your practice. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of answered my question about what it feels like to be here. This is home. This is your mm. sanctuary, your oasis. Yeah. This is you growing food. Mm. Um, it feels pretty good. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What does it, it, it feel like to be here? And not, not with me, but just to, just to the sense of, I mean, it's sort of late. It's a beautiful time of day mm. on a yes. Sunday. Yes. You know, it's time. Then I've, I've disturbed your <laughs> Sunday. You, Preparing for joining us for the workshop and going, oh, we'll just have some cold lamb <laughs> rose from last night, and then I turn up going, give to this to an interview. Um, is it? Is your? What's your sense of place here? It's actually really strong. It's an interesting one. We've got this connection with this place now, and at times we've lost it and we've regained it. So we've had a really interesting mm. journey of discovering. Um, our connection to place and how that feels. But, yeah, this it's interesting because I've only been thinking a lot the last couple of days, this time four years ago, the Tinga Plateau fire came through here. So the last four years have been a really interesting journey of um, rebuilding and restoration after fire. But Four years ago, was that, yeah. so what was that, late 19? No. Like early 2019 we burnt early. before all the rest of the country lit up. So you were, you were in the summer... Yeah. Before the before the mm, the next summer that we was yeah. really and it was yeah it was pretty intense it was um that was exactly four years this week coming week so uh -huh. um I often reflect on that because it was burnt to a crisp and we kind of I don't know we um you didn't want to go outside like we we woke up the next morning and we went yeah this is our house but this isn't our place so this what did you so so this was all burnt yeah everything burnt right up to the front porch no yeah. I've got photos of the fire. Right, everything was burnt. All our gardens were burnt. Um, yeah, everything. We had um, not a lot of grass in neighbouring paddocks around us, but we destocked a week before with about eight hundred kilos of dry matter, and that was our buffer so for kind of ground cover. Food. So when the fire blew over that hill there, it just a ball landed in our paddock and just, and just went just bingo. Went, yeah. Um, the house across here burnt down. Yeah, it's it's. There's no sign of the house now, but there was a house across there. Um, yeah, it's it was. An you, you, this time. is obviously say like you were, house we're sitting actually here. Actually, caught a light. We'd left because we had no water to defend. It was really in the beginning of that really bad drought, but we already had no water. Um, and we left, and our neighbour, who'd be eighty, came down after he looked after his place, and just the side of this corner, just to our left, had just caught a light, no. and he just popped it out. So we were very lucky. Wow. Very Thank lucky. you, neighbour, elderly <laughs> yeah, neighbour. Because he stayed Do you send him Christmas cards every oh, year? Oh, look, where do you, how do you even no. begin? Wow. Like he just said, oh, I thought I'd better come and see how you were going down there. <laughs> and like. Where did yeah, you go to? We just left. Yeah, we went to. I went to town and Angus actually went to work because we went, what are we going to do? We can't defend. We just have to see what happens. Yeah, because we had no water and no power. So. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't much wow. fun. So you left before it got here. Yeah, we left. You just thought if it's going to go, it's yeah. going to go. Oh my we'll just God. make sure that people are safe. That was our priority, yeah. and yeah. Um, get ourselves out of harm's way because with, it was seventy k winds and a forty degree day. So wow. it's, with no water, um, our neighbour had water in the creek, but we had nothing here. So we just we got to go. Yeah. And those, all that scrub there, that was all Yep, that cooked. was all burnt. Everything wow, it's was come burnt. back pretty well. So it's been an interesting journey, but I remember after the fire, I really didn't want to go outside and I disconnected to a place because we were in the thick of the drought 
and then like we had the fire. That would, would have been tough anyway. A year following that with no rain. So um, I kind of disconnected and I went, we went on a trip to Montana um, to do a land listening event with Nicole Masters. And we, um, cool. I went all that way and I was sitting there in this, you know, in the, in this beautiful environment in the Tom Minor Basin doing this retreat. And I got this huge message, you've disconnected at home when it needs you most. Most. And because it didn't look how I wanted it to look. Mm. And it was like it was eye opening. And I said, Oh wow, I've come all this way <laughs> to get a message about connecting back at home, even when it doesn't look how we want it to look. And that was really powerful. Um, it just made me it made sense of it all because then I went, Well, who are we to say what nature should look like? We think it should look how Imposing we want it to look. Opponent, yeah. And if it's burnt, it's burnt. It's still here yeah. and the energy of the plants and everything's still here. But it was just to have to go that far to get a message, but I got the message, I suppose. That's the main thing. And you came back. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to come back anyway. Yeah. And then what what, we, what did you do? We've, oh, we've just bypassed most of your life. <laughs> So we'll yeah. get back to it. Um, you you, you came back, and what did you do to 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 try? What was the healing process? Mm, it was just to be outside more and present with the landscape. Yeah. Just be out in it and yeah. be with it, not hide away because it doesn't look good. Yep. Um, and to notice the small things like small blades of grass growing even without rain, or you know, just you started to look and see things. So. Yep. Um, connect, re- reconnect. Yeah, and and then after that, there were these little subtle signs. Like we thought we'd been grazing, managing, and restoring soil for fifteen years. We felt like the fire had undone all the good we'd done. Like so, you're kind of grieving that process as well. And then there were signs like in the thick of all the dust storms, we weren't blowing. And I was like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and what, how long was that after? That was in the next 12 months. Somewhere. Yeah, we burnt in February and that was by August that year. Everything was, dust was blowing everywhere. Really? Think, Even in August? I think it was around that, you know, that late, or um, probably springtime in 2019. Yeah. It was just It was a horror, horror, horror story. Yeah, it was dust and smoke and there was dust <laughs> blowing off everywhere and we weren't blowing. So I started to go, oh, there's something good still going on here. Yeah. And then by November we started to get a few, few storms and a bit of rain coming through. And one day we looked out to the west and we could see the water running like a river on the neighbouring land and it was soaking in on our side. Mm. And that was just incredible. You were the sponge. Yeah, and we started like, you know, you just start to see little things that give you, oh, yeah, all this this work on soil is not lost. It's had a hard time and it's had the setback, but it's rewarding us. It's still more resilient than it could have been. So, it's like so many things, isn't it? Like there's the, the, you know, as Tony Robbins says, change happens like that, but there's so much that happens. Yeah. Like before that, yeah, the, the, the noticeable change or the decision to change That's or that right. sort of thing. And it's all those years, it's like someone starting a business and they're slogging away going, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm getting anywhere. And then yeah. almost overnight there is success or there's something or, mm. you know, as you say, you notice the water soaking into your place or the blade of grass. Mm. Did you, um, when you came back, I mean, obviously doing a um, land listening course with Nicole, mm. that sounds fascinating, mm. um, and being in a biodynamics and knowing who you are, you're a bit of a spooky wah-wah anyway. <laughs> when you came back, did you did you kind of have the chat and kind of go, mm, sorry, I pissed off? Or? I probably didn't con- – consciously do it that way, mm. but I just became more present. Mm. Yeah, I just made a conscious effort to be present and be out. And not because you kind of, it was a pretty tough year. And mm. you, I think a lot of people were hiding out inside, not wanting to look at their, their you know, everything was pretty hard everywhere. So, um, but it was more to just be connected and just trust the process. To, yeah, it was more just to be out in it and be there. Yeah. And it's, even though it looks tough, yeah, just turn up. Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess mm. if it's your your home too, then mm. you you know, and if you weren't escaping somewhere and you were mm. being present, then I guess you know you've got to go outside and you've got to yeah. move the sheep or the cattle or the whatever. How these trees go this year? These elms and things. These get- ones actually survived. Um, we liquid thought amber. We, we actually thought we were going to lose the liquid amber and the that's a beautiful seventy odd year old persimmon tree. Wow. Um, that our neighbours. I've never seen someone one that big. It's beautiful, isn't it? And wow. we honestly thought we were going to lose them. The best feeling mm. ever was when they came out and leaf. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> the following year because they had a tough time. 
Um, so most of the European deciduous trees actually handled mm-hmm. the fire pretty well. Um, we did lose a few that were in the thick of like near sh- a shed that burnt and stuff like that. But what we've noticed in the last few months, we've been losing a lot of the old eucalypts that were here well before our time. Um, they were burnt, then they were drought affected, then they've been waterlogged and they're just falling over. We had one down over the boundary fence mm. last week and um, it's like, yeah, we need, I often say when I teach farm planning, we need a succession plan for our trees because they might outlive us, but they're not here forever. No. And so we've planted a lot of trees when, since we've been here, but yep. we found the most success with European trees rather than natives because it is a very hard site. The poplar down yeah. there. There's lots of poplars and oaks and elms. I oh, saw. So I noticed. Oh no, I was at Dantani and I'm mm. sure. I'm sure. I was sniffing through their compost and I saw. A, mm. I'm sure an acorn. Yeah. Um, yeah. There. So no, I'm such a big fan of the deciduous yeah. exotics and the, all of the. They actually grew better here. Oh, they do. You they know what? You, g- you give me an oak yeah. and, a, and a eucalypt <laughs> and and like give them water for the first year. I mean, yeah. in terms of you know growth, resilience, and all the other added mm. benefits of. Um, nutrient cycling and shade and everything, yeah. like hands down, mm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. That's not to say I don't like natives. They have their place, absolutely. We need them. Yeah. Um, but you're right, that tree succession. Yeah. Let's jump back to day one <laughs> mm. of your life, Kim. Where did that, where were you, where Where did you appear on the planet well, and how did that all start and I go? I not very far, really. I oh, really, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. I grew up on a farm near Delungra. Delungra. Just west of Inverell. Yeah. So, yeah, just out. Uh, near um, in the foothills of what's called Balfour's Peak, um, yeah. which is near Grajean Peak, these big old volcanic plugs. As you drive between Delunga and Warrialda and you look north, you'll see those big yeah. um, volcanic hills. Yeah. I grew up out there. Um, and my dad's it was my dad's family and my mum's family were farmers at Delungra, so it's in my blood. Yeah. <laughs> and we were growing up on my dad's family property just out in the foothills of Balfour's Peak. If anyone knows where that is, they're doing well. End of a dead-end road. There was <laughs> there's a, no there's passing a traffic. A pretty cool place to grow up. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you pretty well self-sufficient and able to deal with social isolation and things yeah. like that when they happen. Oh, I love that yeah. country out there. Yeah. I mean, there's not much country I don't love, but yeah. it's just I love. It's fascinating. Yeah. So that's probably – that's where I grew up and that's yeah. probably where – even as a kid, I got stuff like if I'd seen erosion gully, I'd be quite cranky. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Why aren't they fixing it? Or you know, there were things you like you had a sort that. of a sense of yeah. I don't know, some responsibility or mm, there was something, about it. and it was just a, thank you subtle, but I was very aware of that sort of stuff as a kid. But being a girl in farming in those days, there weren't real clear career pathways for girls in ag. It was something I was passionate about inherently, something about it always called me in. But, yeah, it was... So school, school at the local uh, in yeah. Inverell? I went to school in Delungra for a bit. Yep. And then I went to Warrialda High School. Yep. And then I ended up at Inverell High for my last two years of school. Yeah. Sapphire City. Yeah. And so did, they, did you do ag there? Yes, or I You did, did science and ag and stuff? I did ag from the minute I could. The minute really? I got Go to that it. subject at yeah. school, I never stopped studying ag. I came a bit obsessed with it. <laughs> I always topped the ag class at Oriolda. And, you and think- I got Tim Varel and I just couldn't beat someone. I was oh. <laughs> so, so do you think that was um, – uh, there's no right or wrong answer to this no. either, but like, was it because you grew up on a farm? You thinking, you, and that was what you knew, and that you were comfortable, and then it was yeah. something you saw. Was it like some deep down thing was like ag farm? It was stuff. something deeper because uh, growing up on a farm as a girl didn't necessarily mean I had any practical farming skills because it really wasn't encouraged. So I probably wasn't very practical, but when I discovered ag at school, I just found something I loved learning about. Yeah, it course. just called me in. Yeah. And it was interesting, but it wasn't until I was probably 16, about year 11, and then uh, they sent around uni careers guides and different courses, and I discovered you could go and do ag at uni. So I was hooked. <laughs> you went, I'm not, it's not stopping here. <laughs> no, I'm going on. But then I'd already yeah. not taken physics and chemistry. I'd done uh, biology because I just chose subjects that I liked, not thinking of, of uni. Yeah. And it something wasn't something in really in my sphere until I discovered that book they gave me. And so I um, then decided I looked, I'd look at all the courses and I remember looking at all the ag degrees and trying to choose where I went. 
And if I went to Sydney or Brisbane, I had to choose between plants and animals. And I couldn't do it. Uh, so I chose rural science in Armidale. I thought so. We've had this yeah, conversation before, haven't we? We have. And yeah. because it was the whole ecosystem, the uh, agricultural ecosystem, and I went, well, cool, It's I don't need to choose between plants and animals. Because even at 17, I couldn't see how I could choose between them. It was kind of weird. I must have been a whole systems thinker before mm. I realised what I was doing. But that guided me to UNE and rural science. Mm. And even though I hadn't done physics and chemistry and they tried to tell me I should do ag economics. I'm like, no, I'm here to do rural science. science. <laughs> and um, it wasn't that hard. I managed. Four years? <laughs> yeah. You did four years? I did four and a bit because I got halfway through and decided to try ag teaching. <laughs> right, really? <laughs> mm, I went, what am I going to do with this degree? And I really didn't know. I just wanted to do ag at uni. It wasn't a great career plan. So I tried ag teaching and... It's like as well kind of thing. Yeah, there was like a ag, degree you, where you could do yeah. rural science ed. Oh, education. really? Yeah, right. So I veered into that, did two pracs, and all the kids doing ag just wanted to throw rocks at each other in the ag pot. And I just went, no, I'm going back to do the full yeah. degree. So I yeah. kind of attacked a few months, like probably six extra months, so yeah. a bit out of whack catching up. But, yeah, that was my pathway and... Um, I'd probably be a, not a bad ag teacher as an adult, but when I was in my early 20s, it really <laughs> wasn't, wasn't calling me. Yeah, I think it takes a special person to mm. decide in the early 20s to be a teacher, I but that's so. really challenging, You're isn't not it? much older than the kids. No. And it was, and you've just been yeah. uh, like um, at the at the end of a te- of, of being taught mm. or for 10 years and like yeah. to then turn around and want to be one of them. I know. That's it a was, big call. It was um, not what I envisaged. So that I took another detour and back, back and did my – Finished the proper rural science degree. Mm. And, um, I was really lucky. I did my honours project as a vacation scholar with the CSIRO in Armadale and worked on anim- like sheep nutrition. I got right into nutrition and thought that was my thing. But then I got out and I didn't really want to work in a feedlot or in intensive animal production. And mm. I didn't so see you, So you the, majored in? Well, my honours, we didn't major much in rural science, did we? But I did my honours in sheep nutrition. Yeah, so your, yeah. your thesis was on sheep yeah. nutrition. Did you have... Did you have sheep in that little plot near Elm Avenue? Like, yeah, that no, up we, there I or? had sheep out at Kirby. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. at and the I, research? Yeah, I would go uh, out there every week and drench them with worm larvae with an old kettle drench Yeah, and collect um, manure samples. Manure samples? And yeah, <laughs> that was my summer. <laughs> Good on you. Yeah. It was really – but I loved the research side, but I then um, kind of – Took a bit of a. I did a bit of a job in research after I finished. On actually, my first ever job it was really interesting. It was writing a position paper on the impacts of of the greenhouse effect on irrigated agriculture in the Murray Darling Basin. Wow! Ahead of your time. It, back in the nineties, I was doing this research. The, on greenhouse, the greenhouse effect. effect That's yeah. right. And I, I dragged that paper out a few years ago. I wonder what we said. I can't remember. And. The, the whole good. thing was we should take a no regrets policy because we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and myself and the professor I worked with and other people doing the research was a bit of a team of us that came up with a no regrets policy to recommend to policy makers. And if only. You mean yeah. oh, as in yeah. let's have no regrets so let's yeah. just let's, make amends and let's yeah. sort this out. Let's act as yeah. if it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Because if it does, we're in trouble. And if yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't, it won't be matter. It'll still be a good thing anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So that was 1992. I'm showing my age now. Good but for Yeah, that you. was my first job and it was like, wow, that's really interesting because it was called the greenhouse effect. It was quite, quite interesting. But then I made a decision to get out into the real world. I could have done a PhD and I – didn't I followed my now ex husband who was my boyfriend mm. to Moree and did some work in the cotton industry? So a lot of people went from yeah. um, rural science to cotton, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, they did because it was there was and even though it wasn't mm. like you can't grow cotton at Armadale, so there's mm. not that direct connection. But there was a yeah. lot of I guess um, soil science and well, so called soil science yeah. and um, weed ma- uh, yeah. management. I get I don't know what they used to call bug that unit bug and, checking. That's it. Well, the whole uni used to move to Moree every summer. And to go and chip a bug, yeah, yeah, bug and, but, yeah. and cotton chip and irrigate. And mm. it would be like you know, Armadale was in Moree and then it was back in That's Armadale. That's it, over the summer and then <laughs> yeah. back again. Because there was so much work there. But, yeah, I ended up following him in, out into the real world. It was a kind of look back, real pivotal moment mm. for me because I could have really gone down a narrow academic path, but something called me out from that. Into the, into the, into the mm. paddock and the field. Because this is the, the interesting because I um, did rural science, as you yeah, know, and yeah. listeners now know. And 
to me, it was a real. Um, it felt like maybe not so much at the time, but certainly afterwards. Like if you're up for a research job or mm. lab job, or you know, wanted a sort of academic. Mm. Mm. Probably veered more towards that, wasn't it? Like to yeah. there was a bit of outside stuff, a bit you know that you that that one might want to do, but um, it certainly didn't kind of rock my boat to mm. go and do that. You know, mm. t- t- too much. Yeah. I was so much more hands on. Yeah. Um. So Maury bug checking. Mm. Um. And what were you? How were you applying your skills to to that? That were you working with a yeah. big mob out there I doing with stuff? A, a bug, I did some bug checking initially yeah. and then we actually went um, up to the Kimberleys for six months and oh, I just followed. Got the ord up there. Mm, followed the ex up to Kimberleys. Yeah. He had an uncle on the ord and he was going to work on their farm and I just went up for the ride to thought, I'll oh, see what happens. And I mm-hmm. ended up doing bar work for six months in the in the tavern in Kununurra for six months. Gulliver's Tavern. Yeah. Yes. No way. <laughs> and um, that was the very first day. I, I was. When were you up there? Ninety three. Probably ninety three. Yeah. Because I went up there in ninety four. Mm, you know, we've just. Missed oh, no, each I'd be is it another Gulliver's Gull- Gull- Tavern? Yeah. I you might... weren't one of those ringers that had come no, in. No, no, no. I was a ringer from the top out of Carlton Hill or somewhere. No, no. A mate of mine was. Um, he yeah. was. He was um, head of the cotton side at. Yeah. Um, uh, no, that was. Uh, at um, Pack Seeds. Mm, yeah, I, yeah. Well, he's doing no, something at Pack Seeds. He was, did yeah. something at Burke as well. So, yeah, that's, yeah Pack Seeds yes, out there. there was. And I, ah. it was fascinating. The very first day I worked there, um, there was a, I apparently served someone who was on the run from the cops. <laughs> so a policeman came to tell me the next day. Oh, and I I've said, just gone, oh, gee, this is a really interesting place. It yeah, was really rough. interesting. And Charlie Barbagello's Pizza over the road? Uh, Had a pizza shop over the road? Pizza. He used to grow melons out, out, yeah. out, out the road. Yeah, yeah. So that was, we were there for a while and did a bit of travelling around and came back. And then um, I settled Cropper Creek, married yeah. um, into a farming family at Cropper yeah. Creek. So, yeah, this chap either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, we were there for a while, but that was really my, I don't know, it was great for me because my in laws were just everyone. Worked so I got I was hands on yeah out so the you, paddock and, okay so yeah. you you were, you were considered mm. um, as worthy as anyone of, yep. to do work not mm. like you're a woman you you've no. got house duties no, here we go we've got another tractor driver and <laughs> <laughs> chasing in driver <laughs> they took advantage driver, of you ball buggy driver I yeah, was, it right. was great so yeah. money cropping yeah they were all cropping um, five thousand acres just cropping yeah, yeah mostly. Right. They were the first people that I'm aware of to ever grow dryland cotton, even when they were told really? it couldn't be done. They were pretty innovative, mm-hmm. and we had a little bit of irrigation, a lot of dryland cotton and wheat and barley, sometimes chickpeas, but all mm. cropping. So, um, yeah, I've spent many hours on tractors before podcasts were invented or audio books. Yeah, <laughs> so you just like, well, I don't know, listening to ABC. Yeah, and you used to get these really creative thought processes driving a tractor. And so I'd say to farmers, Later in my career, oh, you've been on the tractor, have you? I can tell. Yeah. And now <laughs> they get off the tractor and they've been listening to books on podcasts and it's yeah, a completely yeah. different conversation. But Well, that's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because then yeah. they, were had to, they were alone with their own thoughts yeah. and, and then I guess there's the, mm. that creativity that's come from themselves mm. within and yeah. now there's creativity inspired yeah. Through others, mm. as this will be to someone on a tractor mm. one day, I'm yeah, sure. Probably. <laughs> so, 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 did you do more than just drive chaser bins and so on? If having your grounding in rural science was that mm. something that the family was like, "Oh, hang on, you went to uni, didn't you? Well, Why that, don't you go and tell us some stuff?" Well, that didn't really matter. And I discovered, right. I don't know, when I was in fourth year at rural science, I remember Merv Hill. Did you have him? As a lecturer. Oh, what did Merv do? He, we used, he taught us systems. It was ag systems. Oh, And we right. got to fourth year and I remember him saying to us, now you've been here for four years, you're going to think you know everything. Mm. Just be warned you don't know everything. You've mm. got to go out there and realise you don't. Mm. And I took that to heart and went, oh, wow. And then I discovered I really, with all the theory in the world, I had a lot of practical knowledge to learn. So, um, But, you know, my mother-in-law was a bug checker. She did all her own cotton agronomy and a neighbours, so I would help her from time to time and I learned a lot from her. So, you know, I, there was so much I could do and learn mm. and contribute to. Um, so, yeah, I didn't – I just, just dived in really. And So that was – so, yeah, so you, yeah. F- you landed on your feet there then, mm. like using your rural science yeah. – 
skills and background and the yeah. theory and then applying it to... I think where it hit the road for me was the combination of that experience with the degree and then I knew I could adapt to whatever. Yeah. But I think that was really important to get that solid practical grounding, you know, mm. in a farming family on the on the ground um, to then use the degree for me. It mm. kind of all came together then. So, Did you... what what were, When you look back at that degree and and kind of the way it was taught and the... I guess the you know forty units are pretty mm, hardcore stuff. It was a lot. It was a lot. Did you and then and then applying it? Did you and even now looking back, was it? Um, I know it's changed somewhat now as well. Mm. You know, I don't know whether it's better or worse. But was there? Did you have a sense of um, its value then or now? Or um, I, I guess my view was it was very siloed. Everything was mm. separate, and we never put mm. soil biology, physics and chemistry together into one kind of bundle of this mm. is what it actually is as opposed to the yeah. let's break it down to its pieces. Was that, is that something you've reflected on or, yeah. you know, kind well, of? I kept taking soils as electives yeah. and Stuck with feeling soils, let yeah. down but not yeah. knowing why. I'm going, this meant to, I'm not, I felt like there was something missing but I didn't know what it was mm. and it was the soil biology. I yeah. later discovered yeah. um, that wasn't there, but I kept. I knew it was important, and I kept studying it. But feeling like there was something just not missing, and I couldn't. It was just a gut feel. It was mm. like this. This is important. I really need to know this, but I don't. There's something not here, and yeah, and I all came together later. But at the time, I couldn't put my finger on it. I just kept taking soil. I did do soils as electives and stuff. And you stayed with soil, obviously, because you're farming. Mm. So what happened the, 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 through that next period? Was there yeah. moving away? Was there changing of careers? Was there – because I know you were, you yeah. you worked as a – this is what some research. Mm. It, was, it was a really good interview um, podcast you did. I can't remember who it was with now. Oliver, was it, on the regenerative um, – was another podcast. You were talking about um, the financial aspects. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it was yeah. last year sometime. Well, I heard it last year sometime. Yeah. Oliver, yeah, it was that was a great chat. And yeah, what happened next was my I had a major aha moment around soil health mm. at Cropper Creek because that soil is beautiful. It's and it's when amazing. you're out there, you know it's the best soil of anywhere. You mm. know, and proudly say that. Um, and we were checking wheat crops had been sown, and we were just driving around checking. And there was this area of really sick, stunted wheat in amongst a paddock growing wheat. And I've sort of asked my ex, what happened there? Oh, that's where the fertilizer rig ran out. And I've just, in that moment, seen the, I don't think I've ever not been able to see the whole system. Um, I went, in my brain, I went, if that's the soil that we are going to be taking on when succession planning happens, well, that's going to be tricky. Because if that's what's happening without fertilizer, this soil is obviously needing help, you know, and I started to question into things. Um, at the time, the internet was just starting and mm. really couldn't get a lot of information online. Um, yeah, and I, I remember looking for books on soils. I bought one on worms. Um, I was looking for, like, how can I get feedlot manure from up the road and mm. bring it down and what could I do? And even looking for that information, you'd go to the land bookshop in the land or you'd go to the library, but you wouldn't find stuff, would it? No. And, yeah, so I had those questions, but they weren't answered initially. And if he did find all those mm. books, I'm wondering what would actually be, given what's happened in the last, mm. I don't know, 20, 30 years in mm. terms of just research and un, un, uncovering yeah. and, you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And just, of- I was hungry for the information, but it wasn't there. Mm. The minute it turned up, I was there with bells on. So the minute these alternatives started opening up like biodynamics workshops in, when I was here in Inverell or, you know, different um, different things like that um, in the more regenerative space, we would be there because we, both Angus and I, had those moments of an awareness and, you know, this has got to be something better here, like yeah. something's not right. And for me it was seeing that soil without fertiliser. Because um, if you took, oh, clearly when the fertiliser's not there, then yeah. what, what do you got? And some people might go, oh, well, we really need that fertiliser. And I just went, whoa, hang on. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's step that, back a couple of stages yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that was my real, I call that my aha moment. And I remember it vividly. And I think we'll often, if we're taking a regenerative path, have something that we remember vividly in that moment mm-hmm. in time that I, the penny dropped for me. But mm-hmm. I just, like I said, I couldn't access the information then. But 
yeah, when it was there. And by the time we bought this place, we were really on that path already, you know, just accessing more information and doing things differently and questioning everything. So this has been our playground, I guess, for <laughs> all of those things. Yeah. Did you did you alert anyone at the time and go, hang on, what? Like, I don't did, or did you carry that kind of question it. along? Yeah, yeah I yeah. carried it with me because it's so pretty conventional yeah, um, setup over there. Then, yeah, yeah. And yeah. what you know, a lot of chemicals, a lot of inputs. The mm. last year I was there, we were spraying cotton every week, and I had oh, two little four heliotas. Yeah, yeah, two right. young kids. I was evacuating weekly to get away from the sprays while the planes were coming in. So I was I was done with chemicals. Because <laughs> then I'd look around and I'd go, everywhere they're playing has been coated in chemical. All the water we're drinking has been coated in chemical. This is everywhere. And that didn't feel good to me. Um, you know, it was how people make a living, but it certainly felt out of whack for my values around health. And I think when you have little children and you start to see, when I had them, I could see it everywhere. And I'm like, well, we had cotton all around our house. It was just, yeah, I I really wasn't keen to go back near cotton after that. <laughs> and you, did you, you growing food like mm-hmm. around there in a little veggie garden, that mm-hmm. sort of thing? Mm-hmm. And did you, yeah. um, when you grew up, did you, what kind of reference point to, not even going to say, not organics, but like just, mm. you know, less chemical kind of farming or, or growing yeah. food did you have or was it? We didn't use a lot of chemicals. Yeah. Like I don't recall much and, um, you know, we grew all our own food. My mum grew lots of food. My grandmother on my mum's side where I spent a lot of time also grew lots of food and it was not chemically grown. It was, you know, um, it was good. And I, I know there weren't a lot of chemicals used around me as a child on the farm. So I don't remember smelling that smell of chemical, you yeah. know, like, um, so yeah, it was, I wouldn't say they were organic, but. It, we weren't in high chemical use games when I was growing up. It came no. later. Yeah. Mm. Well, I guess that's right. That's yeah. right. As you know, as time went on, yeah. the less ploughing, more chemicals. I was. Yep. I guess it was just a natural kind yeah. of thing. And your experience with you know family, children, mm. household, farm chemicals is probably not that unique. No, no. And it's getting worse. It really mm. is. What we love actually about this place, and something we often say, we never smell chemical here. Mm. We are not surrounded by chemicals and we have clean air. Like obviously they're moving through everywhere all the time, but we're not next door to people who are spraying chemicals out all the time and we're really grateful for that. Um, Was that maybe one of the, I mean, you might not have thought about it at the time when you were attracted to here, like you mm. didn't have a cotton farm mm. right next door or yeah. a wheat farm right next no, door to sort of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's all just grazing land so it's and it's very very low input grazing land mm. because of the nature of the soil and the, the area. So it's actually a beautiful spot to be mm. when you're not wanting that next door, you know, and internally grateful for it. Mm. And so how did you, I mean, you're in a farming situation mm. and, and, you know, extracting yourself or children every mm. week. Mm. I mean, that would have got pretty tedious, it I did. imagine. It did. It did. It wasn't much fun. And I, yeah, I, but I had just didn't want to be there when they were spraying. And it, but again, the dust had suddenly come home, and you'd smell it, and it'd just be everywhere. Um, mm-hmm. So that really, you know, when I left that marriage, I just knew, I was so relieved to not be around the chemicals, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I loved the growing of the crops, and I loved that cotton's such a fascinating plant. Like I really enjoyed that aspect of it, but I didn't enjoy the chemical side. So yeah, yeah it was. That certainly helps steer me in a different direction as well, That having that experience with it and just not, not – and, I mean, once you've got your kids, you see things differently. Totally. You totally start to see what they're growing up with and you're like, oh, is this good, you know? Yeah, so. So they did you a favour in a way. Mm, they did. They did me a lot of favours. Things that I probably would have tolerated, I wouldn't for them yeah. in so many ways, yeah. So, <laughs> ne- so you – Left that situation mm. and um, to a cleaner situation or? Mm. To... I moved back to Inverell. Inver, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and oh, it was close by, but hometown, so yeah, it totally. often happens. But yeah. I honestly did not see myself here long term. Mm. I was a stopping by ground. My boys were two and four, and I thought, well, I'll just stay here for a couple of years till they're at school, and then I'll probably have to move somewhere to get a job. 
yeah. in ag, you know. Um, but as life would have it, all the things I was interested in doing turned up here in Inverell and here I'm still in. So mm. <laughs> it's funny how how that happens, I guess. Mm. So Angus turned up, did he? He did too, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can, we, can you tell me how you met him? Is that a secret or is that like a – We actually met online. On the line, yeah, back in the day. And really? I, How, like, when? What can I? What sort of a? It was early days of that stuff, and we were both very isolated as single parents. Yeah. Um, and I really wasn't expecting I'd meet anyone nice. <laughs> Just curious, and then I. Well, what was it called? Was it what was the platform called? Ah, oh, I don't even remember. Um. Was yeah an early an early, an early an variation early. on on yeah, on yeah. that. But yeah, I read well. his two lines and I went, oh, I'd like to meet him. But I just thought, friend. Where was he? Tenerfield. So oh, not too far away. No, and that was it. Really, just thought it might be a nice friend. He's got mm. similar interests. Yeah, but yeah. It was, and I really did not expect that I would meet someone like him. Yeah, and this was eighteen. <laughs> no, how many years ago? Now? Eighteen. No, twenty years ago. Twenty years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. So how can I ask? <laughs> so did you meet at the? I don't know halfway. <laughs> Where, where, where's halfway? You Glenn? really like going? To no, no, no. Really no. I, I'm always. I'm, no, I'm, no, no, no. So not daggy. I'm, I'm always eternally fascinated by how people well, meet and, sure and, and why. Make sure I met him at a public place because you never know. And um, weirdo from Tenerife. Yeah, yeah. He drove down to Inverell and we just met at a local park and oh had yeah, a, cool. Had a chat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we were really great, great friends. Like we knew that already. Yeah, but, good. Yeah. Connected. Um. But yeah, it was cool. We just instantly hit it off. Yeah, mm. and he he had um because I wasn't going back. I was not planning on remarrying anytime soon. No. But I met Angus and he changed all that. So <laughs> yeah, thankfully. Yeah, and he had he's um he he had family. Yes, he had two kids and I had two kids. And wow. Yeah, it was not that, quite the Brady Bunch, but no, nearly. But yeah, and um. So that was an interesting, that whole blended family mm. experience too. And um, we never had it anymore because we figured four was more than enough to do with. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, they're all all grown, grown, up grown and older and, yeah, left home now, but it's been a pretty good journey. And you all, and you all lived here? Yeah. Well, wow. the Angus's would come down on weekends. Oh, okay. And Because they were in Tenerfield and yep. then the boys lived with us most mm. of the time. Yeah. Yeah, so wow. yeah, it was pretty full on. A lot of lot of chaos. <laughs> oh, totally, yeah. totally. And there's no, I mean, I guess there's no, there's no sort of textbook for step parenting, no. isn't there? Being a parent no. and also a step parent because there's no, no ground rules really. Is no, there? no, it's just you just do the best you can and you just learn a lot of self awareness. I think mm. in that situation, it teaches you a lot if you're open to it. Um, so yeah, we've certainly had an interesting journey, you know, raising four kids between us and yeah, wow. dealing with all of that stuff here at the Oasis. <laughs> and tell me, um, what was so? Where did the so what in terms of career or interests and and, and work and so on? So back to where did the, the, you've always had that fascination or curiosity about soil? Yeah. And then, but there was a point that you did do. You were um, worked with the um, oh, back to the, the yeah. podcast you did. The there. rural financial council rural financial council stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. was that that was in the mix there somewhere? Yeah, I was always called to that too. When I was finishing mm. UNE, they just started that service. It just started off, and I remember thinking that sounds really cool. And I went, someone at the uni was actually working with it or doing something mm. with it. So I went to see them. I said I'd really like to work with it, and they looked at me at a whole twenty two. And they no, you don't have the life experience, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Tell people <laughs> well, how to spend money on whole, farm. What did life have in store for me? But yeah. marrying into a farming family where yeah. I got all that life experience. Yeah. And, yeah, then I, I was funny. Like once Mark, my youngest, was five, that job came up in Inverell and I got it. And I spent 12 years in that role. Um, absolutely loved it. Yeah. So I when did. you so that was you when you're here as well, you were yeah, doing it as yes. well as farming and yes. We, yeah. we when we were here, I probably got the job a year before we moved here. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, and no, I just it had been a calling for me. I think that was it was just not uh, well, I'm not really sure. I've always been good with the financial aspects of it, but to just help people, I think, and I was driven more than just to fill out forms and do stuff. It was more about that empowering people through change, you know. And I've come to see later big part of my thing is um, helping people find their way through challenge and Mm. and change and stuff like that. So I've had my own share of that, but also to help others. And so, yeah, that job, I had amazing employers and it was a great 
job. After, it was a long time to do it for 12 years through many, many droughts um, and hard times and floods mm. and all the rest of it. Um, but that really taught me a lot about, I guess, the psychological aspects of farming because we do we didn't do anything on people at uni totally not yet when we get out in the real world we're dealing with people <laughs> and it's them like our landscapes are a reflection of us mm. so when i drive onto a farm i can sense what i'm getting through when i drive through the gate you, almost yeah, yeah. you know and i had that experience many many times over the years of going to some really interesting farm visits and oh as part of your job yeah. you'd go there to talk to people yeah, about their yeah, farm finances and stuff the, all over the area yeah. and go out on farm where they come into the office. But, you know, you could see um, if people were unwell, they'd been under stress for a long time or, you know, you could see there was this reflection from the landscape health to people health mm. to the state of their mindset. And it was a really interesting job. And all it did was, you know, that soil aha moment I'd had, it kept, I kept seeing declining soil health being reflected back to me talking financials. Yeah, right. it, I couldn't not see it, that yep. connection. Yep. So I kept, and we were doing a lot of soil stuff here, like going to workshops, learning about soils, trying to grow soil here. I now say stewarding soil because I think that's more what we've done. Mm. The soil's grown. We haven't grown it. It has. But I was doing all that stuff here, but I was seeing in the financial statements this reflection. You know, people would ring up and say, oh, we've had three inches of rain, but it's too dry to sow our crop. Well, that's just to me a soil health problem, you know, and yeah. I, I wasn't in a role where I could do much about that, but I just kept reinforcing to me how important soil is to the underpinning of viability of the farming business um, and our own health, like all of that stuff keeps coming up. But that was probably, yeah, <laughs> 12 years of being on the front line of rural adjustment pressures and, you know, working with good businesses and businesses exiting you learn a lot of skills in people and coaching and artists just and the financial stuff, obviously. <laughs> and the, um and marrying um Angus and being a Scottish Scottish mm. heritage, did was that a challenge to get him to open up the wallet and go, come on, no, we've got to spend? I'm probably my- as bad as he is. <laughs> <laughs> and we both we both say mm. that we were very mm. alike in many ways. Mm. So we often don't take huge risks, but yep. we. We also see, like, and the more we do what we do, we see how many, there are many forms of wealth. And money is part of that, but there's this wealth in our soil, there's wealth in water, there's wealth in the food that we grow. Um, what we produce here is amazing. Like, mm. if you look at the retail value of what we eat and how we eat, it, it's huge. Mm. And to produce that broad acre, you just don't, you know. So, um, yeah, we get the forms of wealth, and health is the hugest one. Um, you know, that relational well-being too. So, yeah, it's, it's so much more than just that, but that financial piece opens the door for that discussion because mm. we do live in a world where we have to manage that, totally. you know, so... Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a life part of a business, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Tell me, um, what were what are some of the just on on finances and your experiences mm. in that role? And getting back to you, the podcast, what are some of the sort of I don't know tips and tricks or things that you can suggest that people might consider in terms of I don't know whether it's financial control or considerations or is there any sort of because I remember you went through I can't remember them it was it was a while ago now yeah. but you went through mm. like three or five kind of things I think about just I can't remember the questions that prompted mm. you to talk about that. Was I know anything we were talking about financial aspect of transitioning the regenerative ag and how you know you'll hear this story oh it's not profitable or it won't make me money but m- my argument's always that you have to manage your money through that transition mm. to get to the space of profit because you're looking at profit not production mm. and in the world we operate farming in, we're so trained to measure our success as a farmer on production. Have we topped the sale? Have we got yeah. the best yield? Have we got the cleanest crop or whatever? We're now, when we're taking a more regenerative path, we've got to look at profitability, but we've also got to manage through a transition space. And I think the people, you know, there's that, you'll, we've all heard it, oh, you'll go broke if you do that. But I say you only go broke if you don't manage your business well in the transition and that's where you've got to have good business skills to take a farm from you know this conventional way we do things to a different way and it doesn't matter whether you're going through a succession plan or any kind of transition that financial management is crucial and I think a lot of us don't aren't confident with it a lot of farmers aren't so you know it's um a really 
important area and it goes hand in hand with the soil. So the more soils work I've done in the last few years, the more I've gone back to the financials too. And bringing like for me, it's been a journey of reintegrating all the bits, like the human aspect, the financial aspect and the soil is kind of my sweet spot. It's a real whole systems thing, but it is that we can't do them in isolation. We have to get it handle on our business management and our soil health. They're not one or the other because there's a temptation to go all in and throw everything at it. But without a good strategy, you're in danger of going backwards financially. We want to keep you there so you can farm really well. And so, yeah, that's I'm pretty passionate about the business side of things. Mm. Yeah, and I've been really fortunate to do some work with the DPI business coaching program with the Farm mm. Business Resilience Program. So recently, yeah, oh, cool. yeah, I've got um, a group of farmers I'm working with at the moment in that, and it's been it's a great program. You don't have to be it's not just for regenerative. And I actually don't really wear a regenerative hat. I more come in as a business coach and say, right, what's your business? What's your goal? Um, and what do you need to know into building that financial confidence and financial literacy? Yeah. yeah. Was Richard yeah. Groom? Yeah, Richard Groom. Mm, I think he's been involved. Yeah, with I'm some sure of those. he's been involved yeah. with, with some yeah. of that stuff. I think he has. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, I guess staying with you were um, 12 years mm. with that role, and then when did soil come back and kind of? Come back and go. You, on, you need to pay me more attention. Yeah, well, that was an. Interesting I mean, you were probably doing it out here grazing we were, and so we on. Were and- living it here, and I was doing other things. So after that, I went and worked with Northern Tablelands Local Land Services for three oh, yeah. years as I, their whole farm planning person. So I had the awesome job. I, I was the only person in the state doing this job. Doing what was it called? Whole farm planning. Oh, cool. Mm. Yep. And I reckon we we're the only ones doing it anywhere because that. Um, the board and the, that whole organisation were really passionate about property planning and um, they wanted to focus on it. So I came in and rewrote their farm planning course and then delivered that for three years. And soil, it was very holistic. So we did business, we did, you know, I did the human, financial and the natural resource angles in that course. And it was very much a team approach with the whole of the organisation as well. So that was interesting, but, I, you know, so we, on the last day we'd get out and we'd do a water infiltration test, we'd dig some holes, and I'd see that people were starting to get it. But it was funny, when I was putting that course together, I was researching soil and how I could teach it and incorporate it in whole farm planning because I'm passionate about it. And I found Nicole Masters' TED Talk on soil, which mm. is great. And I went, oh, my gosh, this girl makes sense, you know. So I started following Nicole on social media. Wait, how long ago is this? That would have been about... Oh, sometime around 2015 or 2016. Okay. Probably. And um, followed her stuff for a while. And then Angus and I had spent a month in New Zealand at a family reunion for his family and travelled around for a month. Had an awesome trip. We just got back. He opened his emails. He goes, I found a job for you. And Integrity Souls were looking for coaches in Australia. Uh, and I went, classy. oh, that'd be cool. And um, I put my hat in the ring and a year later I was doing some work with them. So, did you yeah. and you, did you do the did you do like a, a training program or pre, like uh, a, we basically trained on the job yeah, sort of thing yeah. and had regular calls with Nicole once we started but yes. um, I was the only one in Australia and then Angus came on board with me later because he obviously has the same skill set I do as far as soils going diff we complement quite well mm-hmm. um and there Nicole had us in Australia and a couple of coaches Jules and Michael in New Zealand and as a little team we we kind of just learning as we went and regularly tic-tacking. Um, but that's kind of really set me back on the soil path and learnt so much. Like it was just learning by doing and learning through the clients and um, it was a great opportunity and going to lots of Nicole's workshops when she'd be here in Australia. And, yeah. Well, <laughs> and she's coming back, isn't she, she is, April? Yeah. So that was really, that's really honed, helped me hone my soil confidence mm. because, and, you know, by working with, other people I think whatever we do and I've been really lucky because when I work in areas like in the business stuff or in the soil stuff I've had the ability to learn from lots of people and use these skills over and over so if you're not in that space you'll get it but it can take longer that makes sense so yeah you jump in the deep end and you just (laughs) learn as you go Mm. and so you that that, uh, part of that role you were 
engaged by people to um, do on farm yeah. testing and like mm. create programs yeah. and yeah. you know as un- under the integrity soils yes. banner yes we yeah. contracted to them and we would do farm business per Australia so big and we were getting calls from all over um, even before COVID I started doing a bit of online phone stuff with people because the, just the travel costs were huge mm. and with if people are self motivated and can are happy to go out and take some monitoring measurements. Yeah. You can really actually work better online because yeah. they really step in and they own it. Yep. They're not really relying. As opposed to you turning up and yeah. kind of doing it. And, and when you do it with them, they still yeah. don't remember it till they've done it themselves. That's so I right. found that really empowering with the right people. Mm. Some people just need person. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so we started doing a bit of that online and then did a lot more with COVID. Um, yeah, and sort of just – it's a for me now I've kind of fine-tuned that process and it's more about developing this strategy. Like mm. what's first thing first so that, you know, instead of throwing all this stuff randomly yep. and hoping it'll work, let's take a look at your system and your context and what's your strategy because mm. I think that's where people can get all excited and start throwing all the tools around but they're not always the right thing at the right time. Needing a map to follow, like, yeah. a, like a bit of a plan, not so much a recipe but yeah. some sort of a structure or some sort of a, yeah. you know, stage one, two, three, four, mm. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and just learning patience as well. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's one of the things, isn't it? We like to, as soon yeah. as we get results, go right. What are we going to do about this? Yeah. And, you know, that there's so many. Yeah. There's seasonal considerations. There's financial mm. considerations. There's re- other resources. Yeah, and-, and it is. It's huge. It's like that's the really the role I think because we don't affiliate with products, so it's not a mm. normal model. And um, but it that's kind of good though. Yeah, I like it. I just go well. Our su- success is about your business. It's not our selling you stuff. Our we're just selling you our help to get you where you want to go. Yeah. And um, sometimes that means that's a real obstacle. There's a gap when people need inputs, like, oh, where do we find them? And there's a bit extra work for them, but it's really more empowering to be taking that on yourself yeah, and be driving your own journey rather than being dragged by, on someone else's journey. So that's totally. how I like to look at it. Um, yeah, and I, it's really interesting. Mm. And so are you doing uh, – are you still involved with in, uh, the Integrity Soils in that capacity? Well, Nicole stopped uh, contracting coaches in yep. June 21, yep. I think it was, yep. and we just kept doing what we are doing in our own capacity without yeah, that contract. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. But still involved yeah. with her? So, no, or are you doing your own stuff? Just doing really? your own stuff, yeah. She's now training coaches. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, that's something she's, she's doing yes. now in yes. um, down at um, Tombara yeah, at, at um, Martin in Space. April. Yeah, yes. and doing something in Orange. Yeah, I'm trying to pin it out for an interview. Yeah, she's pretty busy. I, I'm sure I'll, I'll 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 sneak over to Orange one day <laughs> if I don't actually do the course. It's in the middle yeah. of the holidays and things, so it might be a bit challenging to yeah. to take the time off. But um, I'll pin it down because mm. I've been waiting for. <laughs> all those for, since before yeah. COVID. Yeah, um, which is she's pretty. Got a bit on though, pretty mm, busy. Yeah. So tell me about so now reinventing agriculture is kind mm. of your your yeah. overarching yeah. you know business. Yeah, your that's what we're yeah. doing, and we're working with the. Give yourself a plug, Kim. Come on. <laughs> well, I guess I say it as we like we work with the people, the soil, and the business. Yeah. You know, and it's that taking that holistic space and helping people to map out a strategy. Um, yeah, soil strategy, business strategy, work on their mindset, expand their mindset. Keep them on track with their mindset. Yeah, because <laughs> we had a chat. Oh God, no! How well that was. Like, would it be twelve months ago now? Probably. Yeah, twelve months. No, 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 it was yeah. sort of then the year got Time's away, going. and I know it was just a bit nuts. So yeah. I'd like to yeah. re- reignite that conversation we had twelve mm. months ago. Things have changed a bit for us. Mm. Um, so lots going on, and other interesting things. Michelle might have. Mm. Talked about, which is very exciting. Mm. Um, so, what else? So, in terms of reinventing agriculture, what are some of the things that you um, you know offer, kind of thing? Yep. And this is not. I mean, this is a plug, and and, and <laughs> it's, this, no, <laughs> we can this do. Is <laughs> we, I offer like I think, I think I, it's, no, I we think need to. We need to talk about a lot of people because I yeah. feel like I don't fit in boxes very well. Mm, yeah. But that's part of being a whole systems thinker and yep. a generalist, yep. which has been the theme of my whole career. But we do the soil restoration strategies and we can do those just with coaching visits or we can do monitoring stuff. So we do have clients where we go back each year and monitor their soil health. 
or six months and we just keep taking monitoring data to help them keep getting the feedback from the system. Mm. I think some people need a hand with that or it doesn't happen. Well, and in, and interpreting the data too. Yeah. Like you yes. get a list of all these numbers yes. and percentages yes. and stuff. It's like, whoa, what does that right. mean? Yeah. That's right. And it's the physical sort of help yep. we really focus on. We <laughs> might take a few soil tests initially, but we really focus on the physical soil health and watching those changes over time. So we look at soil restoration strategies and try and help the people put first things first. Also do the business coaching. Um, and, you know, just basically I also still teach whole farm planning because I love it and I do mm-hmm. occasionally get called in to deliver a course with whole farm planning angles, which is great. Um, do a lot with women in ag. I work, I contracted oh, yeah. with the Rural Woman Cooperative and that we've I've done some a few different programs with women. Rural, in ag. rural women cooperative. Yeah. yeah. And that's really exciting. I love the work I get to do there. Do a bit of group coaching. I've group, done some group coaching with some women in dairy, other women in ag coming back into the workforce or just doing um, – we had the plateful program run a few, a few times and it was all about, I guess, women growing food and fibre with regenerative ag. So um, that was amazing. And mm. go, growing – it's for me, I'm really passionate about women's voices yep. in this space because we often sit back and don't speak up. And I see so many capable women in regenerative ag who are deferring or not speaking up. So I recently ran a training session at The Rural Woman, co-hosted with a friend of mine, and we spoke about finding our voices to speak and our journey to that because I, I – I love sharing my story because I hated public speaking. Mm. <laughs> I avoided it like the plague. And then I ended up in a role as a rural financial counsellor. I was expected to go out and speak to groups mm. of people and sometimes quite large groups of mm. people at very stressful times. So I had to learn. I had to sink or swim and I actually grew to like it. But I've sort of shared a few stories where I've done things that I often we think we don't know enough or oh, I, I don't know it all yet. Well, we're never going to know it no. all. Um, but in sharing that story, I've been watching women stepping up and presenting in the region X room there, and it's just so good because it's like I'm not special. I've just gotten out of my own way and had a go. <laughs> I don't know yeah. it all still. I'm still learning. I'm still in that process. And for me, that's I think that's really valuable and just seeing women spe- stepping up and speaking and putting, you know, being out more visibly in the space because that's also a huge part of regeneration is integrating the feminine aspects into the whole again so that's been really rewarding that's like i do lots of different things well i'm glad you're in that space <laughs> too because i mean for lots of reasons <clears throat> your contribution but and, and you're another one in the space mm-hmm. which is important because there hasn't been enough really there's been an imbalance here i say <clears throat> and what 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 the fear of the of the species brings is is um uh, is uh, is mm. <laughs> so much more than the men can. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I always really care. Come on, boys. Always, it's about. Come well, on, admit it. I'm always really careful. As good as Angus chicks. will probably be hearing me going. <clears throat> really careful to don't say it's say not it. men versus women or women not versus at all. men. <clears throat> us together. I know. And using our strengths. And totally. It's so important, and it starts with us as women. Yeah. We don't need to wait for someone to give us permission. No. To <clears> you have note. every. You don't need a permission note to say you know enough. No. You just share right. what you know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think it's it's, it's critical that, mm-hmm. that more women are in ag, and I think it's one of the things that's actually got, you know, dare I say, mm-hmm. regenerative ag or whatever you want to call it, that kind of a, a movement or a or a consciousness or a mm-hmm. you know a reconnection back to the landscape. Um, it is it is in a case in point. It's like mothers going. I don't know if I want to be cutting my kids out once mm. a week because they're spraying chemical mm. over my farm and my house yeah. and my food. Yeah, now that's a that's a big one, I reckon. Yeah, um, yeah. and and just that nurturing and just the even those who aren't in that sort of a chemical ag situation, mm. but just questioning and 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 having the impulse to just feed their kids much better food. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is is such a critical even just critical to thing. grow a bit of food, even a little totally. bit. You know, it yep. doesn't take a lot to grow. Like we've always grown food, even working full time, chasing four kids, because that for us that was our priority. Yeah. And I know we're not normal, <laughs> different, but we always managed, and we found ways to make it easier over time. Like in you know, just putting on an irrigation system on your veggies, yeah, so that you it gets watered while you're at work. Like that sort of stuff was life changing for us. So you know, it's just in doing little bit where you can um it all matters doesn't mm. it you know oh totally yeah but yeah so I, you can see i do lots of different 
different work, but that is who I am. I'm very much a generalist. <laughs> Talking about general things, mm-hmm. I want to just switch to um, soil carbon, you know, mm-hmm. the topic of, I mean, there's, um, there's so many levels to it. There's there's the, the um, soil, tar- soil carbon economy. There's the, you know, over many, many years, it's been the the creation of or the commoditization of, mm-hmm. of soil carbon, rightly or wrongly. Um, you know, in a farming context, and then now we've sort of got lots of agencies who are able to help farmers leverage that value in their carbon or in even natural mm. capital. Um, so really interesting space. Mm. I'm still tap, you know, sort of stepping into it, sort of just seeing where that all lies, and mm. you know how that fits with us, and what the benefits are, and you know, mm. kind of just making sure we're not getting caught in anything we don't. Doing things we don't want to do, getting tied up with different things, um, but the then the sort of you keep going along that timeline and the sort of the the well, it's a timeline, but it's also kind of a stepping towards a um, how do I say this the more interesting global mm. trends about soil carbon and you know and then if you go keep going past that to you know will one day. We all be on some social credit scoring system where mm. we'll have a we'll have a quota of how much carbon we can emit the, as a, a family. A license, yeah. You've mm. got you're allowed to emit this much this week or this oh. day or this year. Yeah. And if you go over, you're not going to be able to buy meat because it's that's be a, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. What are you, have you been following that? Have you got thoughts on that? Where, oh, yeah. where do you think that's going? I've been pretty passionate about soil carbon for a long time. Mm. Not trading it, but getting it back in soil mm. because it is the foundation of soil mineral health biological health and physical health. So for me, I've been on a mission to get farmers to actually understand their soil carbon and how they get it there and how they lose it because it is, it, it's a bigger driver of farm profit than yield. It's actually our soil carbon. So and there's been studies that have shown that. So um, when I was teaching whole farm planning, I would often talk about soils and health and carbon as in does anyone in the room know what soil carbon they have? In three years, I had one farmer who knew and no one was looking at it. No one Mm. was aware of it. And so my mission was just to get them aware of how that improves the water cycle if we're talking whole farm planning. The benefits of it. Yeah, you're going to be rewarded for it. I'm just going to see if that's still on. That little blue. Yeah, Yeah. still blue. It's cool. You'll be rewarded for it. Whether you're, if you get paid, that's a bonus. You are going to be rewarded for this regardless. Somehow. It may may, may well be financial, but indirectly. Mm. Yeah. That's right. It is going to reward you with compound interest once you get things going in the right direction. So I just started raising a lot of awareness on it. And then when the soil carbon space started opening up, he goes Angus with all these electric fences. Is he coming back or is he going? (laughs) Um, There's that bloke. There's that bloke walking around the garden again. He's avoiding the mic. (laughs) Um, but yeah, he. I started getting like it's got to be a good thing if people get more carbon. But then mm. I started getting a bit nervous because we're monetizing nature, mm. and I'm like, again, I I look at wealth has many forms, and are we? So I'm questioning, and I'm I'm sitting in a space of questions, which is what I often do. Going, are we reducing its value by making it a dollar value? Because mm. this is the underpinning of life itself. Surely that's more valuable than money. But we don't value anything other than in monetary terms. So it's got to be a complete culture shift mm. to get us as a society to see that. And so those are the questions I'm asking, Charlie. I'm just just sitting in a space of keeping an open mind. Mm. I get the benefit for all of us if we restore carbon and we restore water cycles and the planet and you know, everything. But I also go, yeah, but the motivation does it have to be you know, we live in a world that's so driven by dollars, but there are so many forms of wealth and our soil health is one of the ultimate. And how do we get, how do we all start to value those things more than money? <laughs> well, I mean, there's no doubt that farmers, I think generally or certainly in our sort of mm. space are valuing it more yeah. because it's it's kind of like, oh, shit, totally. that's, that's the source of, mm. you know, quality, quantity, yep. life, biology, the whole thing. Yep. But water I guess cycling. water yeah. cycle, yeah. So there's definitely a, mm. a value being placed on it. Mm. But you, you're right. I think that when that turns into a dollar value and mm. and and then – you know where what is then what does then become the motivation? Hamish has a very clear view on all this, which you'll no doubt tell us tomorrow or, cool. or, or Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, it's not surprising, you know. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, I, I share it somewhat in the commoditization of, of carbon. I mean, I am looking at it going, oh, well, you know, yeah. the dollars, the cents, yeah. you know, and where's it all lie? But I'm also looking at the liability, you know, yes. what does that mean? Are you getting caught I up think in? there's a lot of work if you're going to go down that track on carbon literacy, isn't there? Like mm. it's a whole new language. And a whole new, you need to get a handle on what all of that means. And there's mm. a lot, like mm. it's a lot to get your head around. Mm. Um, and understanding those markets as well as what puts carbon in your soil, what takes it out, because it is meant to flow through. It's not a static thing. So, you know, we've got to understand all of that and have that carbon literacy to go into that, whatever. And then I think it's just go in and do what's right for you, but being really careful. Yeah. Talking about the flow, <clears throat> I interviewed Zach Bush. Mm. Um, uh, back in December, and I can't remember if it was in the interview I did with him, or or one of the talks he did in that in when he was out here in early December, and he talked about um, he, a lot of people who would hear this, not necessarily listening to this because yeah, mm. so pe- people listening to this are probably kind of reasonably open minded anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure there's plenty of people in the world would have been horrified at what he said. Mm. He said, "Thank God they found that fossil fuel, that oil." In the in those areas, because the interesting thing is that the, the the oil, and I guess the coal in some extent, but a lot of the oil is in areas that were. I mean, what what is oil? What was it? It was mm. plant life, mm. you know. Mm. So what did that mean? Well, that must have been in that area above that oil, a mm. whole lot of plants, mm. you know, like a massive amount of plants that, that supported megafauna and all sorts of crazy things. And then over many many years, obviously, it's turned to oil. But a lot of that, where did that carbon come from? Mm. It was above ground in the form of plants and animals and atmosphere and everything, and now it's all yeah. it was underground. Yeah. <clears throat> so thank God someone found it, released it, mm. and in and, and in releasing that, pretty much created the earth we live on with all the, you know, the the conveniences and the the life and the buildings and the cars and all these things that we take for granted now. And so that in itself is like you man, you what do you mean burning? You know, like that's that's people have a hard time sort of you know, getting their head around that. And then there's like, but what does that now mean? The a massive opportunity to, to, to sequester that carbon back and, and put it into a form where it can then support mm. vegetation again. Yeah. And regardless of how we do it, we know we've got to do it. Yeah. But yeah, it is, I guess, just, you know, being, I think the biggest thing is just finding reputable ways if you're going to go down that path really doing your research and you you know going finding reputable companies to do mm, it isn't mm. it because it's yeah. probably a few companies out there that aren't reputable and probably it's often the way jumping in and going oh make some money out of this bloody go, carbon I think stuff go in with your eyes open and do as much due diligence as you can on your yeah. carbon literacy and understanding carbon research <laughs> is anyone that you steer people towards or no? No, we basically don't take, we don't steer anyone towards anything. The way we work is just independent of yep. all imports, traders, yep. whatever. It's really, um, if I if I think something's dodgy, I might suggest that, but I don't publicly. <laughs> steer them away. I want to get back to women ag and women yeah. in ag. Is anyone that you kind of work with or you want to shout out to or just go, oh my God, they're amazing or they inspired you in 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 um, in agriculture, yeah. you know, Australia-wide around the world? Women in ag as in role models that I've Yeah. Had. Yeah, well, it's interesting because when I started in my career, I probably well, my biggest role models were probably my mother-in-law Yeah, because she was just so hands-on and practical and I learnt so much from her. Um, and then also when I was rural financial counselling, there were lots of women in that, my boss and Fran Rowe actually started that service. She is as a volunteer from her, you know. And What's her name? Fran, Fran Rowe. Yep. She's from down in the Central West. The whole Rural Financial Council oh, service right. started because she started filling that need yep. and then it's been government funded ever since. So those sort of people who saw a need and went and did it mm. and got on with it were quite, I guess they were good role models, but, you know, the whole, there's been probably many, many women in agriculture that have inspired me. It's just probably picking one or two is very hard. Um, but, you know, they all do. The women I coach yeah. actually inspire me no end yep. with their wisdom and their foresight and their connection and the stuff that I get on coaching calls from groups of women. And this stuff is just gold. Like, they're just out there living it. They're not big names. You don't see them anywhere. 
but those are probably the ones that inspire me the most because they're just living it because it's their truth and it's what they do. So there's many of them that I've worked with that are doing their best to live this. Yeah, and, and seeing it from a totally different perspective yeah, too. Yeah, you know, yeah. from a you know from from a, a set of nurturing eyes mm. or family eyes or succession yeah. eyes or yeah. um, more natural eyes, maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they get out, they get up every day, they do what is right for them. Yeah, and yeah, they might often they don't think that they know enough to speak up, but when they work with me, I'm always encouraging them to share it because mm. it is up to us to just step up. We don't need to know it all. As I said before, we often think like often think we've got to be overqualified to speak up, or someone's got to tell us we're now at a point you're allowed to speak up. No, don't wait. Just share what you know with somebody, even if it's your neighbour mm. or somebody, and you don't have to be an expert. One of my favourite stories, and that's totally off topic, but it's just coming to mind, so I probably should share it. Mm. A few years ago, I dabble with photography. I'm nowhere near a professional photographer. I just love it. Play with it, cool. you know. And I got asked by a friend to teach a photography workshop. Cool. And I was a bit out of my comfort zone because I'm the last person I would have thought should be teaching it. But I went along and we ran. It was a Capture Your Creative workshop with a friend running it from the Rural Woman Cooperative. And I turned up to run a photography session where I shared a few tips and tricks on any camera. Like, you know, off we went. Everyone had fun doing it. One of those women went on to become a professional photographer. Wow, good and for you. And it was only because I shared something I loved without being an expert yep. and showed her a few little tricks, taught her, told her where I learnt things So she and she just went and did it. You inspired her to get so, one yeah. more step down the track. And right. I didn't need to be an expert. No. I just needed to share something I love doing. And mm. if we all take that on board in any space, just share something you love with somebody, don't wait for permission, don't wait till you know it all because you're not going to know it all. Mm. <laughs> Um, you really can change someone's life, can't you? Well, I mean, just I guess the the, the podcast series of Regenerative Journey is a case in point because mm. you know there's some you know, reasonably well known people that I interview and they've been fantastic, um, and that's all often the ones that people don't know and mm. and um, who all have stories and they're not necessarily experts in anything. They're you know mums, dads, husbands, wives, whatever it is, farming, not even farming, and. Everyone's got a really compelling story and has – it's interesting, you know, how I give them a nice, comfortable environment, their mm. own mm. happy place to sit in and talk. Mm. That's that's where the gold is, yeah. you know. Yeah. Just giving them a bit of, bit of license to – to or feel like they've got the license to go and yeah. talk their mind, speak their mind. And Angus often reminds me too, there's a lot of men who don't speak up much too. Mm. And I think for all of us, it's just to, if you have an opportunity to share something you're passionate about with somebody, don't be attached to them getting it or changing everything. But if you share it from a space of just because you love it, then you never know what impact you'll make. Mm. So, you know, you can't be attached to them or getting regen ag straight away or all seeing things the way you do, but just sharing it and men and women, and if we get asked to share something, just take the opportunity. Yeah. You never know how what you share could reach somebody else. Mm. And I constantly get blown away when I hear something little that I've said and how that's rippled out. So, yeah, you never know. Just, and not being attached to how I'm talking to you. Like, yeah. like, you never know. You never know where it's going to go. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's got me worried a bit too, though. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I, well, I, I'm sure there'll be people listening to this. I'm sure. I hope so. If any of the other ones are um, mm-hmm. uh, need to go by. Now, I'm thinking the sun's going down. Mm-hmm. We've been at it for a little while now. Is there anything... Um, um, anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap this little bit up? Because then we're going to go to a bit of a Q and A for our Patreon members. Um, so, was there anything else you want to touch on? Anything else that you're doing that you'd like people to know about um, in terms of reinventing agriculture or any other pro? Oh, I actually, yeah. I'll, get, I'll get to the projects in, in a minute. Anything else you want to touch on? Um, probably not. Just oh, check, biodynamics. Guess, Tell us about yeah. the biodynamics here. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you did a course with Hamish in, in 2006. 20... Yeah. We, Where was it? Here at Inverell. Inverell. At Billabong, yeah. actually. And um, I'd have been called to permaculture and biodynamics before I even knew what they were. I just always had this curiosity around them, yeah. but I didn't understand them. Biodynamics, I certainly didn't understand. And we went to a workshop that Hamish was doing here, a couple of day workshop back in 2006. And my mind expanded, but it just felt right. Everything mm. about it, I was just called to do it. And I remember Hamish saying, you only fail by not doing it. My scientific brain did not understand anything. 
but we just did it and it, we've lived it since then and we've just done it and even if it's not perfect we'll do it yeah. and you know like sometimes people come to biodynamics and get a bit rigid in their thinking particularly when you look at the planning calendars and things like that and I will look at those but if something's just got to happen I will time it if I can if it's just yeah. got to happen I'll just do it like yeah. I you have to be real world about this sometimes but yeah. I, the more we work with it the more it just seems to time anyway like you you just got to give it a chance and do it you don't have to understand it you never will <laughs> no, it's um, it's it's a, there's a lot to it, isn't there? It? Is. So you just got got your yeah. We've been spreading bi- biodynamics here since then, and it's just I don't know. I've had the most amazing ideas when I'm out spreading biodynamics because we spread yeah. by hand. Yeah, good. And on you. it's just it's a form of connection with the yeah. place. Um, here I'm flicking my <laughs> biodynamic brush. <laughs> <laughs> Your virtual yeah, brush. Yeah, I am. Um, but yeah, it is very very much a part of our routines here, and we're far from perfect with it, but we just keep showing up and trying to do what we can. Yeah. What else have you noticed in, in anything in particular? Oh, the taste of our food. Mm. It's incredible. Yep. I just You can see why biodynamic wines and cheeses and dairy products win awards because it takes it to a whole new level. Mm. And I know our food is incredible. We really struggle to go away and eat because <laughs> we've got yeah. such good food here and to so, pay for the and, and to pay for that food is yeah. like are you serious i know it's it's hard we went up into the coast last week for five days and we took lots of food with us mm. <laughs> we just if we're traveling close by by road we take our food because we can it's different if you're on a plane or something but um yeah you really do notice that it's in it's it's this energetic, subtle shift. Like, I don't know. We notice our animals become intelligent to place and it's just a and it's an energetic thing, isn't it? And it really does feels good. I don't know. It does feel good. It just feels this place good. feels good. Yeah. I think it does. And yeah. I've had friends come here who who've just gone, Oh my gosh, this feels good. You know? Yeah. Um mm. Well look, um, Hopefully the next couple of days are going to feel good over mm. there at Danthonia yeah. with Hamish and I. Um, and thrilled that you guys are going to join us. I think mm. it's fantastic and we get a bit of a bit of a bit of a not a G up, but just you know. Well, you never know. It's like it just yeah. another layer on the onion every time, isn't it? You can't stop learning. Yeah. And it's also as much. Mm. I mean, we we do a you know like a question and questions bro mm. questions down and we answer them throughout the, the couple of days, and. Um, but it's the interactions between people. It's yeah. even people going, "Oh yeah, I tried this and this happened," and you know, and it's even things like like um, Johannes over there. He's mm-hmm. got Johnson Sue things, and and Hamish and I have been encouraging people with Johnson Sue to go and pop the preparations yeah. in. And yeah. I go, "You've already got it sort of exactly mostly done. Just oh, drop them in and see what happens." Yeah. And you yeah. go, "Oh, yeah, that'd be an idea." So yeah. it's just sharing ideas. And and mm. look, you know, I'm no expert. Hamish is a freak. He's, he's, he's just so good. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no, it's all good. And then, um, but we're really looking forward to having you guys and our and mm. our pretty pretty full um, crew there over the next couple of days. Kim, I have to say, it's been so enjoyable, and I love sitting here at the Oasis um, and watching the Sunday go down, mm. sun go down on a Sunday, and it's so peaceful. It is, isn't it? We're going to slip in a few quick Q and A's um, just to round out the your experience, and um, it's been. Fascinating. There's so much more. I know there's little holes in your story, not holes in your story, but like there's gaps <laughs> there's <a> where <laughs> like, oh, I just know there's more in there, but we'll do, we'll we'll have more chats. Mm, there's anyway. a lot. Yeah, there's always a lot, isn't there? I oh, know there is. Yeah. It's like, it's, and then this is the same for everyone. I've never got to like, mm. gee, I better wrap this up now because there's like nothing else to talk about. But uh, I'm just thinking about the time I'm and our Q&A. where we've gone. Man. Well, Everywhere. no, that's great. No, because there's, I mean, there's so many, it's like there are so many, it's like a tree, isn't it? Like you start mm. here and then you could end up. Anywhere else? Oh, just you might be able to help me here. This one, a little quick one. I was walking through with my family today at Byron Bay, looking at trees, and I was thinking, Hamish might know about sacred geometry. Mm-hmm. Do you reckon? And maybe people listening might have some idea about this. Say the tree there, and there's a volume of wood that's at a certain level. Pick a pick a point in that trunk, yeah. And then, if you were to measure that volume, say in a, I don't know, one centimeter kind of area that's a that's a set volume of of, of wood in that trunk mm. and then if you moved up to another elevation and then looked at how much wood is in on that elevation mm. and added all that up and there's a lot of there's a lot of leaf on there so whether you'd count the leaf as well and it, is there some pa- sacred geometry ratio or pattern of wood as a tree grows i know there's lots of sacred geometry within a tree there's some yeah. sort of like you know 
every centimetre you go up or every metre you go up in a tree, there's mm. a certain ratio of wood that is... I wonder. Whether, it's, whether it's more or less. Or whether that's different for different trees. It could be. Maybe each mm. tree has its own specific ratio. I mean, mm. obviously there's a branch will be torn off by a mm. truck or a yeah. windstorm or something. There's all those variations. Yeah, there's a lot of stories in those branches, aren't there? Totally. You know, when you look at the tree and you look at what it's seen in its 70 years, that tree that we're looking at, we know is 70 odd years old. Wow. Um because our neighbours aren't planted it when she was young. <laughs> wow. So, um, and that's yeah. a big persimmon, isn't it? It is a beautiful persimmon, yeah. And so imagine what it's seen in those 70 years that have to be, yeah. I think with all of, everything's patterns, isn't it? Totally. So it's a good question, one I probably have no answer for. No, I don't know if <laughs> there is. I mean, there probably is. I'm sure some, you know, sacred geometry fiend would probably be able to tell me, but I was just looking at a tree there today going, I wonder where... That all fits in because I because yeah. there's lots of I can't remember where it was but um, lying down and Angie and I were doing some thing we we're lying down looking up mm. through the tree through it not even some meditation thing and mm. then and then there's a whole lot of sacred geometry which I couldn't really identify as like there's just a lot of twigs and branches mm. but it's just I mean it's another thing isn't it nature's just always incredible offering up crazy cool stuff you know it, yeah in- incredible. In- well, let's leave it at that. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up, and we'll do some little Q and A's, and then um, cool. Kim, that was awesome. Are we Thank better? You. Should we do? We need to go and find Angus to like before. Is he, is he tend to like? It, you know, the sun goes down. It's dark. He'll come in. He's yeah. like, where is that? He's probably avoiding the microphone. <laughs> he would be. Oh, yeah. I'll hit him up. Somewhere. You wait till you talk with him. <laughs> I know. I can imagine. Maybe you should do. You should do him another time. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. We'll do. <laughs> we'll, we'll get onto the Q and A. And next week on The Regenerative Journey, my guest is Clive Bircham, a good buddy of mine. Actually, I have a lot to thank Clive for because he convinced Angelica, my my wife, to go to Landmark Forum many, many years ago, and it was at Landmark Forum, Forum that I met her. So, uh, Clive, thank you for, for uh, catalyzing our relationship. Um, all those years ago, Clive um, is a wonderful fella. Um, you'll know more about him next week in The Regenerative Journey, but just to mention... Um, he's certainly done full circle grew up on a farm, corporate life crazy things all over the world, amazing successes and ups and downs and uh, looking like um, farming might be in his sights again in the uh, in the very near future. Lovely fella, enjoy this interview next week Clive Bircham on The Regenerative Journey This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media If you enjoyed this episode please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.